um, Eileen, Jane, Julie, and Catherine, and all, all the people at TEDx, uh, congratulations. What an honor to be here, to listen to everybody uh, throughout the day. Uh, I really feel like everything I've ever needed to know, I've learned at TEDx Stouffville. Uh, this is kindergarten for adults. It just makes sense. It all makes sense. Why can't we just go and you know, do this all the time? This is fantastic. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm a documentary maker. Um, and I'll be talking about media in a bit of a roundabout way. I wanted to share with you, oh, I need a clicker. Or a pickle, they called it, I think. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I want to talk to you about a journey that I've been on uh, for the last few years in my latest project called High Rise. And I want to talk to you, I've named this uh, talk, uh, The Search for the Urban Species. Um, and I, I have to confess, uh, well, well, first of all, I just want to say that you probably all know that the earth is now urbanizing. We are more, since 2008, we are more urban than not urban. Most of us live in cities. But we really don't think of ourselves, I think, as urban species. Uh, it's, not, it's not a way that we identify ourselves. And for most of my life, I have to confess, I really have been a stupid downtowner. I just thought that to be urban was to drink a cafe latte downtown in the core, or even you know, quaint, lovely uh, downtown Stouffville. That is what I consider urban. Um, and, I, and I really thought that the urban species lived downtown. More than anything, I despised concrete residential high-rise buildings. I thought they were so ugly, and I just wanted to turn away whenever I saw them and drove by them, especially here in Toronto. Um, and despite my upbringing um, in a single-family home, I did have early run-ins with high-rise buildings. When I was five years old, I lived in Paris for a year, uh, on the outskirts of Paris, by the Boulevard Peripherique, and we were the only, it was a new building, it was one of the modernist buildings of the time, and we were literally the only family in the building except for a couple with a cat on the second floor. And the, 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 the thing I really took away from that building was just the sounds, the really scary sounds for a kid, the whirling, constant whirling of that traffic and that subterranean highway just constantly going by, and then the sound of the wind traveling through the building. It was just haunting, and, I, and it still haunts me today. When I go into a high rise, I just go right back to that building. Um, I also visited uh, many of my relatives in Prague, I'm Czech, and so I'd often go back in the 90s and visit my, friend, uh, my, my friends and relatives in rather dreary high-rise buildings in the South City, a, a huge suburban high-rise complex 20 kilometers south of Prague. Um, and it was just really building after building after building as far as the eye can see. And it, it's really been with a considerable amount of humility that I've begun to question and challenge my own notions of the urban and the vertical. And it began, um, that's Paris, that's Prague. I've forgotten about these slides. <laughs> um, uh, it began on a trip to Moscow. I was an independent documentary filmmaker at the time. And we were going to Moscow, and the subject of the film insisted on booking our accommodations. He goes, I, I know Moscow, and I'll, I'm going to get us a really good deal. And we all thought, great, you know, <laughs> we need to save some money here. So we arrived, and we were shocked to see that the, the Moscow that we imagined, you know, his Moscow was certainly not the Moscow of the postcards. We were at um, Praskaya uh, subway station, literally two hours by subway from the center in the south. And we were in one of these buildings and really dreary from the outside. You know, we were, it was an apartment hotel, 20 US dollars a night. Huge apartment with like seven bedrooms. <laughs> but it was pretty dreary. Um, but when we got on the elevator and, and just, you know, meeting all the people inside, I could hear Chechen, Uzbek, Azerbaijani, Cantonese, uh, languages from all over the world. And I, I realized it was the first time I was in a contemporary global, global, globalized suburb. It was just a really interesting experience for me to be riding this elevator with construction workers from all over the post-Soviet Union. And um, when we went downtown to Red, Red Square, some of the crew, we were standing in this big, beautiful square, and there it is, you know, just Moscow in all its glory. And some of the crew were like, oh, I really wish we were living down here. You know, this really sucks. I've gotten to Moscow, and here I am at Braskaya Station. And that's when it dawned on me. I realized that what I was learning and seeing and witnessing at Fraskai Station was a lot more interesting than anything I could have ever learned downtown. Um, when I moved to Toronto and I became uh, the National Film Board of Canada's filmmaker in residence at St. Michael's Hospital, um, we, we worked with young parents of no fixed address, so homeless women who were parenting or pregnant. And they really also taught me about the, the new reality of the Toronto that we live in today. 
When they were homeless and living in shelters, they would come to our weekly uh, participatory media workshops, hands-on workshops where we got them making photographs and photos and photoblogging to teach us about their world. Um, they, they were just a hop, skip, and a jump from, uh, from, from, uh, from the workshop. But when they stabilized, when they actually got rental housing, they suddenly were stuck way out in the burbs, and it took them an hour, two hours sometimes, to get down to the workshop, and we had a, a significant rate of attrition. People stopped being able to come to our service because they just lived so far. And it reminded me of Moscow. It reminded me of Prague. It reminded me of Paris. Um, the city that I thought of was just not the city that I really live in. And I think this is a really huge, huge, huge moment for me to, to think long and hard about how urban geographical um, segregation is at play with who we get to know and who we actually become and who we are. And my naive understanding of the, of the suburbs as being a retreat for the middle classes was so outdated and it's just completely wrong. The urban peripheries are overflowing with humanity and yet they're so invisible to the drive-by eye, to our closed mind. So when the NFB approached me uh, after Filmmaker in Residence and asked me, you know, let's, let's take some of the philosophies and ideas of this incredibly experimental project and take it to a new level, I said, what, what are you interested in? I didn't miss a beat to say, I want to search for the urban species. I want to understand the city of this century because I don't think we understand who we are as urban creatures. And um, we, I wanted to continue experimenting with both form and content and the approach of, of telling stories. How could diverse voices and, and, and bringing an agency of the people who the stories are about bring them right into, into the story telling itself? And I wanted the project to be local. I wanted it to be grounded in the experience that we could have in Toronto. But I also wanted it to be global because I think those two things are really, really more intertwined than we realize. We partnered with a group of academics from York University, um, headed by Roger Kyle, and it's an incredible group of 55 academics around the world who are studying global suburbanisms. And it's a big mouthful, but it's a very important idea that the peripheries of our cities are actually have much more in common often with each other than they do with the city that they're connected with at the center that they surround. And uh, today's global suburb really does not look at all like this image, uh, that's, that's really what, uh, what I began to learn with this group. Um, and we have to think that, you know, when I, when I would try to get you to imagine the kinds of suburbs and the kinds of peripheries I'm talking about, um, it's the edges of the cities that, are, that lack public discourse. They lack public infrastructure, they lack, lack public planning. And they're, you know, as Josh mentioned so beautifully in, in, in the talk about food, um, food deserts, uh, these are places that are driven by developers and private interests. We're, you know, we're thinking airports, highways, waste dumps, manufacturing, light industry. And mixed in there somewhere are these huge tracts of residential high-rise buildings. This is where people live out their lives. And the high-rise building, the concrete high-rise building, is the most commonly built form of the last century. Um, we in Toronto, as, as Josh mentioned, we, there's, there's more than a thousand of them in our city, and that's more than any other city in North America after Manhattan. It's pretty, pretty unique. So for the last three years, I've spent a lot of time in rather unusual places, in, in these suburban vertical uh, buildings, and it's really transformed my understanding of urban culture, of globalization, of migration, and the way that urban politics are, are defining our, uh, us as a, as, as a species. So when we began High Rise, my first instinct, after having heard from the urban theorists and the architects and all the wonderful sort of th thought leaders, was I want to learn from the residents. I want to learn from the people who've actually, actually lived here, live, live inside. And so in Toronto, we began working in this building. Um, it's in a super block, 19 high rises in a row on Kipling Avenue, 20, it's about 20 kilometers northwest of City Hall, so it's really in the inner suburbs. And we used, um, we went there every week and we met with six residents and we asked them to use cameras to document their lives and uh, to tell us their stories. Uh, so this is Irene and she's been in the building for 10 months. Uh, and she, was, she, she did beautiful pictures and, and stories uh, of, of her world. This is, this is a quote from her. Back home, there's a lot of scenery, a lot of green. You can sit on an orange tree and pick fruits, eat, just enjoy. I don't have that here. I'm in an apartment just looking around. And when you look at the swimming pool, it's cemented over. 
We brought the residents' work into an exhibit and a live presentation that we brought to City Hall, a place that most of them had never been to, even with some of them, many of them have lived in Canada for decades, 20 kilometers, not so far in, in, ge in geography, but you know, a planet away in terms of culture. And here uh, we have um, the former mayor, David Miller, who introduced the, the speakers. And uh, we presented in front of 300 people, huge, wonderful crowd of urban planners, architects, deans of schools, city administrators, politicians. And it was all an effort to amplify the voices of the residents in the discussion about what our city should and could be. In another project, um, it's a global project called Out My Window, this is also part of High Rise, we've been finding lots of remarkable people all around the world. And we decided, I decided, I thought it'd be really interesting to do an internet documentary. So this is not a film, this is all on the web. And each one of those windows, when you arrive at the site, is a different city in the world. And you click on it, and you enter somebody else's world and lives. Um, this is Alamar. It's the world's largest public housing project in the world. It's 15 kilometers east of Havana. And it was built by Castro in the late 60s for the new man. <laughs> and um, this is inside one of those apartments, not what you'd think. It's a poetry collective having a, a slam. They're running an underground poetry festival in seven apartments because they lost their space at the cultural center. This is also a suburban high rise. It's outside the city of Tainan in Taiwan, except this one is a high rise cemetery. In Asia, we're running out of space for our dead and even cemeteries are increasing in density. Julao is 90 years old, and she has got a spot here for herself, along with hundreds of her family members. New conceptual frameworks need new forms of storytelling. And as a documentary and documentarian, I've spent most of my working life looking at the digital revolution, how, um, how these new technologies are affecting our media and our lives. And High Rise is an experiment in how documentary itself can participate in change rather than just standing back and observing it and looking at it. I, I really want to know how can high rise residents be part of telling their own story? How can they tell our story of the urbanizing planet? I directed this project out my window over Skype, email, and Facebook, and I worked very closely with local journalists and photographers, uh, architects, um, housing activists, and high rise residents so that they could tell us their stories from inside. And we found countless stories of people turning the wasted into the, waste, uh, into, the, into the purposeful and even the beautiful. We also discovered that many of these, uh, many of these towers are, are completely dilapidated. They're aging. They're coming to the end of their first life. They're post-war buildings. And um, what are we going to do with this concrete legacy around the world? At first glance, uh, we might assume that you know, you look at a building like this, it's filled with low-income people, right? It's a poor people's problem. And I think that um, Anne addressed this question so beautifully, um, this notion that somehow it's the poverty, it's the cause. The poverty is, that's why this building looks like so terrible. End of story. Well, it's not quite so simple. The billion of us, billion of us living in these dilapidated high-rises around the world um, are in fact a rich, diverse mix of humanity. Uh, many of them are well-educated, upwardly mobile, gainfully employed citizens, both in the developed and developing world. Take this place, Mira Road, a suburb of uh, Mumbai or Bombay in India, for example. Our high-rise researcher, Paramita Nath, went inside this huge suburban complex to meet and discover the doctors, the accountants, and the engineers, India's rising middle class, who live there. She found residents who commute two to three hours a day from this place to the center to very meaningful employment on overcrowded trains, to commute again two or three hours back home to, to these buildings that the, the walls are crumbling, there's no running water, and many of them are actually sinking into the very swampland that they were built from. These are buildings that are barely five years old, and people have paid a lot of money to live there. The dilapidated global high-rise is not a consequence of the income levels of the people living inside. The crumbling high-rise landscape is emblematic of a much larger crisis, and I think we've heard about it today in many different, many different refractions. It's urban planning, it's severe corruption, it's lack of regulation and property development, and public mismanagement of our cities. We fundamentally lack a vision to successfully house the urban species as we move into the century ahead of us. The world is massively urbanizing, and we're not planning for it, we're not keeping up, and the Band-Aid solutions we're coming up with often profit a very few of us, and, and there is a lot of profit being made off these buildings and exploiting the rest of us. And there's been many different responses to these dilapidated buildings. 
Um, uh, most commonly, it's obviously neglect. But in Chicago, this is a community that's been completely torn down. And this is a response that's happening a lot in England and in the US. And the idea is um, you know, it's being met with some resistance, especially by Graham Stewart, who is a fantastic architect here in Toronto, who talks about how there's so much energy embedded in this building. Why are we tearing it down, wasting more energy, and then more energy building something new? Why can't we look at something like Prague, you know, the place where I used to visit my, my family so many years ago? Look at it. It's, it's had massive national investment. And it, it's, it's, it's called Tower of Renewal, and it's turned into a wonderful place to live. Reclad buildings, uh, new windows, new plumbing, and most importantly, developing the social fabric around the buildings. There's daycares, there's good public transit. It's a wonderful place to live. Think of jo uh, Johannesburg in South Africa. This uh, community, Hillbrow, was for many years considered a hijack uh, hijacked high-rise. Hijackers would go into these, these buildings and kill the landlord or the property management, strip the building of all its resources, um, the, the elevators, the windows, the plumbing, the, the wiring, everything. Like, everything is gone. People are climbing tw you know, 20, floor, 20 stairs to get home every night with no running water up there. Um, and then they'd extort the tenants uh, and threaten them with death if they didn't continue to pay rent. Well, a Kaya neighborhood organization came in, which is an incredible uh, uh, collaboration between the city and the, and, the, and the citizens, the residents of these buildings, went in and reclaimed building after building after building and turned them into a tower renewal project, not just on the outside, but also on the inside. Even amid concrete slabs, we can find humanity and hope. The possibility for renewal and for environmentally sound, human-friendly high-rises is, is not a pipe dream. I used to think that the city was something that happened to me. I think, I think um, our, our talk about outdoor nature, really, uh, that, that, the idea of, you know, don't be determined. We need to be self-determined. Um, the city is something that we build every day. We, we can participate in its creation. I've been seriously asked if I'm pro-high-rise, whether I think that there should be more high-rises and more condos in the world. And I, I don't think I can really say that in, in, in good faith. I can say that... Um, that we can't continue with the urban sprawl in North America that we've been living with. And I can say that probably most of these buildings don't need to be torn down if we approach them in the right way and early enough. Um, and definitely, if we unquestioningly march into the future thinking that the city and private uh, marketplace forces will solve our problems, well, then we're definitely facing more segregation, more inequality, and most definitely violent conflict and civil unrest. In previous centuries, we've defined ourselves by language, by culture, by religion, by nations. But in this century, to be human more than ever before is to be urban. And yet we have such a meager understanding of what that really means. So by understanding this new urban species and including the voices and the solutions from inside the buildings, we can consciously and actively and positively rebuild and recreate the defining feature of the urban species, the city. Thank you so much.